Today on The Rounders, we are talking to one of the premier Trains with a Z root builders and YouTube content creators. All aboard! In days past, the roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Gozarek, and this is episode number 93 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby. You name it, and we discuss it. Today, we are talking to Approach Medium, also known as Joe. He is a train Z root builder who shares his work, not just the finished product, but also how he builds his roots through YouTube, live streaming and video content. We are talking to him about his approach and why he loves train simulation, how it compares to model railroading, and what he's looking forward to seeing as far as train simulation technology. Before we get to that, though, I want to take a moment to thank all of you who are supporting the Roundhouse on Patreon each month. The fact that you are willing to help offset the cost of hosting the show on the website and making it possible to do some of our travel episodes, that means a great deal to me and i really appreciate that you're willing to donate even as little as one dollar a month that is highly appreciated we have a new patreon subscriber joining the roundhouse crew and that would be thomas murphy i appreciate you thomas for joining and if you wish to support the roundhouse go to patreon.com slash the roundhouse or you can find the link on the roundhouse podcast.com Our guest today is a Train Z Railroad Simulator root builder. He's a YouTuber. He's a Discord user who builds these incredible 3D worlds. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Approach Medium. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can call me Joe. A lot of people know me as Joe, so uh, we can just do that from here. Glad to have you on the show, Joe. What got you into train simulation? Well, you know, the thing is, I've been doing this a lot longer than I think most people think that I have, and I'm a bit older than I think a lot of people think that I am. Um, I got started with the train simulator back in 2003, 2004, and it was really a, a product of where I was in my life at that time. In 2003, I was just graduating from high school, and all of my friends were going away to college. And I was not. I was home going to, to community college and I was I had no friends. Everybody was gone. So I had a lot of time on my hands. And uh, one day I happened to be in a video game store and I came across Trains UTC and uh, I bought it. It was like in the discount bin for like 10 bucks or something like that. And I picked it up and I was immediately hooked on it because it was just everything that I wanted at the time. The, the possibilities were just limitless um, at the time there was a lot of assets available and, um, I kind of felt like the potential was there to just build whatever I want without any, uh, constraints in terms of space or anything like that. Um, so a lot of it sort of stemmed from the fact that I had a lot of free time and, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of space for a, a real actual model railroad. I had a little end scale layout in my garage, uh, well, in my parents' garage, uh, that was sort of falling by the wayside. My parents had done some work on the house and some of the, the layout had gotten damaged. So uh, I was looking for a, a, an excuse to continue with the hobby and, uh, and, and sort of not be as obtrusive in, uh, in the physical space as possible. Back in the days of Trains UTC, I remember that was my first version of the sim. There weren't a whole lot of others out there, basically just Microsoft Train Simulator and that was it. Now the field's wide and why do you stick with trainsy um at this point it's just because i'm very familiar with the user interface and I'm, I'm pretty invested in terms of the assets that i have available at my fingertips uh and i've built quite the community around this 
uh, particular game. So I have people who are willing to make assets for me or show me where other assets are that I might need that I that I can't find myself. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the train's interface, as difficult as it can be to navigate sometimes and as dated as it feels sometimes, is still one of the best user interfaces that are out there. I've never experimented around with um, the other train simulators. I think that's what just train simulator, I think, is the other one that's out there right now. Um, I know you can build some routes in that. And there's some other route builders out there that do use that. Um, but from what I've seen from the, the interface, it seems a little bit more difficult and clunky. Uh, and I really like the ability of trains to allow me to like really get down to track level and put in as much detail as I want and uh, easily create assets if I need something. If I need a, a building, uh, we can put together a building pretty quickly or I can go on to Turbo Squid and buy one and convert it for the game or I can have somebody make it for me or any little detail asset that I might need, I can, I can populate it pretty easily into the game. Uh, so I find that, that Trains just has that sort of, um, uh, it, just a good experience for the, for the most part. Uh, there are some downsides to the game, I, I would say, but uh, for the most part, I'm, I've just been using it for so long. I know how to use all of the tools. I, I've gotten really good at um, laying out track very quickly. And I think if I was to trans transfer into a, into another simulator, there would be a, a tremendous learning curve for me. And I would just kind of be back to square. One. Yeah. When I first started with train Z, I didn't like the queued system. I didn't like the fact that since a route didn't actually include the assets with it. So people who are unfamiliar with how train Z's file system set up, when you build a route, every object is referenced. So it basically, it has the geometry and sort of what goes where, but it doesn't actually include those files. So then it goes on to something called the download station to pull them. At first, I didn't like that system because I didn't like the fact that if somebody had removed something or a file wasn't on the main download station, that you had a really difficult time finding it. But now I have to say, I find it so nice that if I'm looking for people figures, if I'm looking for a particular type of industry, there's a window I could go into the content manager and just search something and go through photos and hopefully find what I'm looking for. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's sort of the benefit of the game right now. And also it's, it's pitfall uh, as well. I would say like, as you put it, that there are a lot of times you might download a route that has a lot of missing assets because they're not on the download station. They're from a third party website. So it boils down to you having to either go on the, the forums or go on like my discord, for example, or go on Google and try to search the QUIDs that you're missing and try to find where those assets are, because not everything is always on the download station, um, which could be it's it's beneficial and not so beneficial at the same time. But uh, I think that's where a lot of new users get hung up on the game is that they download all these routes and they're like, I'm missing the track or I'm missing these buildings or there's these big gray areas. Why don't I have the stuff? Uh, and they don't realize that they have to get stuff from the download station or they need to get get it from third party uh, third party websites. It can be kind of confusing and convoluted at times. Jack Fuller asks, what got you into building routes? And I'm going to add on to that. What do you consider to be your first complete route? So what got me into building roots, uh, it, again, it kind of go, it, it kind of stems back to 2003, 2004 era. Um, by, uh, by about 2004, 2005, I was finally going away to college. I was moving out of my parents' house. So I no longer had a basement space for my end scale layout or any space for any modeling at all. I was living in a dorm on Long Island. Um, I had no space for any sort of hobby supplies or anything like that. So to, to be in the digital world, again, it gave me this limitless possibility of, of building whatever I want. So that's sort of where I started to really get into it um, was when I was in college. And, you know, aside from doing regular schoolwork and going to parties on the weekends and doing the normal college stuff, whatever little bit of free time I had, I did like to go into the game and just, you know, drive some trains or, or you know, whatever it might be, just blow off some steam. And, you know, at the time, there was no sandbox games. There was nothing. There was no Minecraft. There was nothing like that. There was... There was nothing out there. So if you wanted to build your own world, this was kind of the way to do it. So I used it as a way to, to just de-stress and uh, stay into the hobby for as long as you know I could kind of manage it. Um, and I think my first route that I made, uh, you're, I mean, I'm thinking back a long ways here. It was probably, it was probably trying to replicate my end scale layout that I had at my parents' garage because that was something that I was familiar with. I knew where the tracks were. I knew how big the layout was and I was pretty familiar with it. So it was kind of easy to do. 
And uh, from there, I was still subscribed to Model Railroader magazine, and I picked up all the Model Railroader, you know, how-to books and um, modeling scenery and all those books. So I would just find layouts that that I thought would be kind of cool and tried to replicate them as best as possible using the track plan that they had and some of the the pictures they had. Um, But I didn't really start getting into route building probably until 2010 or 2009, 2010. I started to take it a little bit more seriously and wanted to get more into the detailing and, and that sort of aspect. But to begin with, it was just spaghetti bowls of track. You know, I just wanted to drive some trains and just replicating things that I was familiar with. 2010, you get into seriously route building. 2016, you decide to take that online and share that on YouTube with the Pennsylvania and Berwind project. Before we get into the route itself, why did you decide to go to YouTube? Getting started with YouTube, it's kind of a two-part answer to that. Uh, part one of that uh, is that right around 2016 is when I started. I think it was 2016, like you said, was uh, when I launched my YouTube channel. I had just finished up the Franklin Avenue industrial route for N3V, and that, that is a map that is included with the game now. They had asked me to build it for uh, Trains Model Railroad 2017 at the time. Uh, so right around the time that I started my YouTube channel, I was just finishing that up. And by that point, I had taken a bit of a break from the game. I, I hadn't played it or I played it on and off for a few years, but I, I really wasn't as into it. When I finished the Franklin Ave route, I was I, I, the fire was lit. You know, I, I was I felt really inspired again. Um, Trains, a new era had just come out. So there was a, loads of new assets. The game looked really nice and polished and clean. And I think I was coming right off of 2010, uh, Trains 2010. So there was a bit of a leap in uh, in the quality of the assets and, and the way that the game functioned. So I was kind of like a little bit more motivated to get back into things. And I had originally started the PNB back in like 2009 or 2008 or something like that. It's it's been a long it's been a long process. Uh, so I had get, getting back into the game. I was like, let me revisit these routes that I hadn't finished and. You know, I started to feel motivated again. And right around the same time, City Skylines was coming onto the scene. And in particular, was coming onto YouTube with a lot of these really great YouTubers building these highly detailed cities and uh, these huge maps with with just tremendous amounts of detail. And I, I was watching all these guys and I was like, man, they are doing some amazing work. I'm doing the same thing in trains. I wonder if anybody else is doing this in trains. So I got on YouTube and I started looking up videos to see if there were any trains YouTubers doing similar things to these city skylines guys. And there were none. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, wow, I'm doing the same thing that these city skylines guys are. I have a background in video production. I have a microphone. I've got uh, video capture devices. I've got editing software. I got everything I need to launch a YouTube channel and, and do exactly this in trains. So that was sort of one of the reasons why I made the jump to to YouTube. The other part of that answer is uh, I wanted a a reason to stay motivated. Uh, I'm the type of person who I'll procrastinate for a really long time on things, on anything. I'm, I'm a procrastinator. And unless there is a deadline or people waiting for me, I, I'll, just, I'll just sit on something forever. So... I kind of figured if I start getting onto YouTube and I start showing people some of the techniques and the things that I do, it'll help me actually finish this PNB route that I started a million years ago. And maybe I'll learn some things in the process, get some feedback from some people, make some friends. And that's pretty much how it worked out. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm pretty surprised that to where it take, took me up to this point. Uh, I didn't have that in mind when I launched the YouTube channel. I was just doing it as a, a fun way to show off some of the some of the stuff that I was working on and just a you know, keep myself motivated to uh, progress in the builds that I was working on. It's clear when you watch any of Joe's videos that he has a video production background. I've got links in the show notes, or you could just search Approach Medium on YouTube. His episodes are nice and concise. They feel like episodes. So he's walking you through the build process of a specific scene. He'll often compress the time so that it, it's a little tighter to present and showing start to finish on a particular industry or an area of a town. And I think that makes it really entertaining 
uh, one of my other rail fanning friends introduced me to your channel at first and he's not that active in train sim these days but he just liked having it on in the background i think he described you as like the bob ross of trainsy don't know if you've gotten that one before <laughs> I, I have heard that before yeah, I, I've heard a couple people refer to me like that. I don't really think of myself like that, but I do appreciate the, the compliment. You come onto YouTube with the PNB. What is the Pennsylvania and Berwind? Okay, so the Pennsylvania and Berwind, just to put it out and, and just, you know, get it out there, it, it is not my original work. This is not, the route was originally created by a user on the trains forums named Bill M001. So Bill M, who, who I still speak to the, to this day, he created a route in Trains 2004 called the Pennsylvania and Berwyn. And back in 2004, the game is not what we know it as today. The game was really more designed to be a model railroad simulator, not a train simulator. So a lot of the layouts that you'd see or the, the routes that you'd see in trains 2004 were more model railroad style, style loops and spaghetti bowls of track and, and that sort of thing. And Bill M came onto the scene with this, this route on the forums that was fully functional and, and self-contained. So every, every industry that is on the route has a destination and an origin somewhere else on the route. So you can you can set up your train cars and run it infinitely uh, forever because everything is just going to be being shuffled around on the route. So back in 2004, nobody had ever done anything like this. It was revolutionary at the time. And for the most part, the P&B had gone unnoticed among probably a large portion of the community. But there was a good chunk of the community that that took to what he had done, what he had designed, and and, and loved it. And he created a whole bunch of paperwork to go with it, um, rules of the operating department, a whole switch list of what trains go where and what they contain, um, where all the industries were, what they produced, what they consumed. He created this whole spreadsheet and, and all this paperwork that I still have printed out and, and on my desk constantly to this day. And that was just absolutely incredible to see for Trains 2004. And that, that really got me inspired. So we fast forward a little bit here, a couple of years. He builds this route in Trains 2004. Trains 2010, we get Trains 2006, then we get Trains 2010. By the time Trains 2010 had come around, the P&B, the original P&B by Bill M was broken in, in the game. And a lot of the assets were all defunct or they didn't look good. And he didn't have a newer version of the game. So I had sent him a message. Uh, at this point, I had already been talking with him back and forth quite a bit. But I had sent him a message and I said, hey, Bill, would you mind if I start rebuilding the P&B in Trains 2010? Or maybe it was Trains 2009 uh, at the time. I can't remember which one it was. And he said, yeah, you're welcome to do whatever you want with it. You've got my full permission. Um, you know, have fun with it. So I was like, awesome. And... At that point, I got started on on the route, and I must have rebuilt this thing, I don't even know, 20, 30 times by now, maybe even more. Uh, it, I started with it in Trains 2009, and then I moved it in Trains 2010. I built the whole thing. I laid out all the track from Grafton to Allegheny to Junietta, and everything had been laid out. But every time I moved to a newer version of the game, things would get reset, or I would lose assets, and... Uh, it was just too much. It became too much for me to keep up with. It even got to a point where I think I was on the forums and I decided that I was going to just let it go. I was like, all right, here, I'm done. I'm not going to build this anymore. It's open. If anybody wants to download it, I'll send you the file and you can finish it. But nobody ended up messaging me for it. So I ended up keeping it sort of in my archive in the back burner of the game for a long time. And uh, following probably 2011, 2012, my own life had taken over. I wasn't playing the game very much. I was really busy. I was working in the film industry. Uh, I was working on set a lot. I just didn't have any free time, so I didn't have any time for the game. And then, as I had said, we fast forward up to around 2015, 2016. Uh, I started to get back into the game and uh, get more motivated again. So I decided I was going to pick the route back up and put it out into the world for everybody to see. And uh, lo and behold, it ended up being a huge hit. Uh, it, to this day, it's still probably my most watched series on my YouTube channel. I'm constantly getting asked questions about when I'm going to be working on it next and what when I'm going to complete it. 
um, and what what part of it is going to be worked on next and that sort of thing. It's it's a big route. It's um, I want to say it's about 40 miles long and it contains three major yards, one at each end and one in the middle. So the overall functionality of it is supposed to work like a miniaturized uh, regional railroad where you've got a yard at one end and then a division point yard in the middle and then another yard at the end. And you could shuffle cars throughout. Um, there's many, many branch lines to switch and a lot of online and some offline industries. I kind of expanded onto this idea and sort of expanded the route linearly a little bit bigger. So Bill M's original route was, I think, 34 or 36 miles. And I think mine is now up to uh, probably 50 miles, I want to say. And that's not counting the the branch lines. Um, and I do have plans to expand on it even beyond that. But as it is right now, that's a lot of mileage to to uh, work on and detail and and uh, cover with trees or buildings or you know just keep it interesting in general. But uh, for the most part, it's been doing really well on YouTube, and a lot of people have gotten back into the lore of the P and B and are just as attracted to the route as I was back in 2006, 2005 when it had first shown up on the scene. So it's really good that people are involved again and, and are really excited about it. And I always make sure that I credit Bill M as the original creator, uh, because really he, he, he created the script for this whole thing. He, he is the script writer and I'm the, you know, if we're going on film terms, I'm, I'm the director or the cinematographer. I'm, you know, taking what his original vision was and trying to update it and, and bring it into the game for everybody to be able to enjoy and not just, um, you know, have to stick with the, the old version. I, I still don't think he's updated to, to Tainer. As I keep off, doesn't take it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been great. It's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite routes so far, I think. That's one of the things that I really love about Train Simulation. There's ways in which it feels like the world's largest unofficial railroad club as a collaborative entity. Trains in particular, this idea that you may be building from scratch or you're building off of somebody else's route, but regardless, that route is containing track by one creator, bridges by another, somebody who did trees, somebody who specializes in water textures or ground textures, somebody who specializes in rolling stock, all these different niches or sub-niches that people really like to focus on and you're bringing all of these elements together and that creator of those tree assets may never know that you're using her or his work for your root but now it's a part of this thing that you've created so there's anything that we're doing for train sim is built off of so many people which is really fantastic absolutely it's it's a it's certainly a collaborative gameplay if, if you look at it that way it's it's much like a film set where You've got people who are specialized in in different things that kind of come together and make this one big thing. And uh, in this case, it's it's one big map. Your next major project that you embarked on was the Dry Brook and Esopus Valley. What was the inspiration behind that? The Dry Brook and Esopus Valley is really a series of scenes from... I guess from my life growing up. So the DBEV, I'm going to refer to it as the DBEV because it's just shorter that way. Uh, the DBEV is heavily, heavily inspired by the Catskill Mountain branch of the New York Central Railroad. And in particular, sort of how it exists in modern times. So for a little bit of context, the Catskill Mountain branch uh, exists in the Catskill Mountains of New York State, which is where I grew up. Um, it was originally it connected the city of Kingston all the way out to the city of Oneonta. And it was like a hundred and some miles of uh, track through the Catskills. The short story of all of that is that my grandfather worked for the railroad and he worked on the Catska Mountain branch in the 60s and 70s. And this is long after the branch had been cut back from Oneonta. So it only spanned about 80 or 90 miles out to uh, Stamford, New York. So... I grew up in, in Kingston, New York, and I grew up along the Catskill Mountain branch, and I grew up knowing that my grandfather worked on that line. Well, the Catskill Mountain branch was abandoned in 1977, and then it was purchased by Ulster County and uh, Delaware County uh, to, to be used as a tourist rail excursion. 
And the Catskill Mountain Railroad was the, the, the operator of the Ulster County section. And they were supposed to restore track uh, from Kingston out to Phoenicia. That's a whole nother story. Uh, they didn't really succeed at doing any of that. That's a whole nother podcast. Uh, but so I had grown up watching these abandoned tracks slowly be restored um, by the Catskill Mountain Railroad. And I even had the opportunity to volunteer for the Catskill Mountain Railroad for a period of time and help restore these rails that my grandfather used to work. So the inspiration was there. And I really wanted to recreate that without being totally stuck with uh, recreating the prototype exactly. So rather than actually getting like a DEM or some kind of like orthographical uh, map put into the game and replicating the Catskill Mountain branch track for track and, you know, the way that I would want to do it and and that sort of thing or the way that it actually existed. Uh, I wanted to just take the elements that really inspired me and kind of combine them into just a linear set of those scenes that I, that I really enjoy. And for the most part, it's, if you go on Google earth and you look up Kingston, New York, and you see where the main track is and the branch, it follows a pretty similar path. Uh, I'm not going to deny that I, I didn't necessarily rip it off or anything like that, but it's pretty close. Um, but essentially what I did was I compressed a lot of the distances and I took a lot of the scenes that I enjoyed the most, um, specifically tracks behind buildings in the city area, uh, a, a large section of track that cuts through farmland, uh, steep grades, track next to a creek bed, and then some abandoned type stations and that sort of thing. But what I wanted to do was do it in a way that it was still active, but sort of defunct at the same time. So I created this whole backstory uh, about how the railroad was rescued from abandonment uh, by a group of um, enthusiasts in the early 90s. And again, it sort of follows a little bit of the Catskill Mountain Railroad story, but not quite. It would be it would be an idealized version of what could have happened in real life, I guess is the way to put it. So I sort of just distilled all of that down into something that uh, just best represented the area without being an exact copy of it. And I just set up each scene as if, you know, it was a real place and built this whole story around it. And in fact, um, when I did the release for the route, uh, Steve Lero uh, and I had had teamed up for a, a portion of this uh, to create the passenger excursion consist to run on the line and we created this whole video which was scripted out and had this backstory and he hired uh the guy from pentrax to to narrate it and um i think it ended up being like a 10 or 12 minute long video and it came out it's outstanding you can see it over at steve lara's uh knl trains um youtube youtube page um but anyway it, it was such a thorough backstory that i had come up with and that we had put together for the script for this that we were getting comments asking if it was real and it, it actually got to the point where the, the volunteers, the guys on the Catskill Mountain Railroad, on the real thing, ended up messaging my approach medium page, not knowing that I was also a part of the Catskill Mountain Railroad, just saying that they loved the video and they loved the route and everything like that. But they didn't put two and two together and know that I was the same person. Um, but but it was it was real enough that the guys who actually work in the real deal were able to recognize it as at least in uh, – you know, a, a distilled version of, of the real deal. And, and to, to this day, that's probably been one of my favorite, uh, fully completed routes from end to end. Uh, and the possibility to expand on it and, and make it longer or, or, you know, backdate it to like the 1950s when it was fully active. Uh, the possibility is all there and it's all things that I've considered maybe doing another series on and, and opening it up again and maybe either modernizing it or, or backdating it. But, Uh, That's definitely been one of my favorite builds so far. One of the things that I've really admired about the route is the fact that this feels like a lived in world. It doesn't just feel like track was placed down and buildings were placed down. There's this sense of that it has a history, that it has a past, present, future, that you're part of a story of it. So when you're seeing the railroad as you've currently modeled it, it's not in pristine shape where the everything's in clear. You've got decaying infrastructure here and there. There's a bridge that's washed out. The The excursion train set uh, has, as a lot of 
uh, Taurus Roberts in the 90s had to face uh, of this whole hodgepodge of mismatched equipment. But there's something that makes it feel authentic that you're really you're going into these details and going, well, they wouldn't just have this infinite budget to have whatever steam engine they wanted and a fully matching set of cars that they did have to kind of piece things together. I think that's a really interesting approach to take. Absolutely. And and that's always my goal with any project that I get into is that, uh, as you said, make it feel lived in. Uh, that's always been my goal is to lay out the buildings and lay out the roads in such a way that it does feel like a real place. And it's something that I, that I picked up on looking at other routes through, throughout the years where, you know, you'll see an industry, you know, with a switch track to, to serve the industry, but there's no road, there's no parking lot, there's no way that the, this industry is connected any other way to the outside world. Or these houses will be in the background like a housing development, but there's no road or there's no power lines or there's no, you know, things like that I've picked up on and, I, and I've said to myself, any project that I do, I want to feel like it's legit, like it's a real place. So when you're playing in it, you are immersed because that's that's my goal for me. When I'm playing in a simulation game, I want to feel immersed. I want to feel like I'm really there. This is a real place. So I try to do my best in my builds to to also replicate that. Besides these larger projects that are looking to emulate the real world, you've also done ones that are based on model railroad track plans of others or those that you've designed, examples being Union Terminal, the Appalachian Central. My personal favorite of yours is the Dayton and Troy. That was a really great uh, route to to build, and it posed quite the set of challenges to actually make it happen. Uh, it, it was a route, oddly enough, that I had bookmarked in a model railroader magazine back in whenever it came out. I think it was the issue was in like 2004 or something like that, a really old issue. And it was before I was really building anything in trains. And I just I remember thinking to myself, this is a really cool article, and I really like this track plan and I, I dog eared the page and I shoved the model railroader magazine in my closet for 20 years. And while I was, it was actually, what was it? Two summers ago, I was looking for something that I could kind of build really quickly. So summer was coming up and, uh, I wanted to be able to like take some time off, but still have content on my page, on my YouTube page. So what I ended up doing was bulk recording that entire route in the course of two weekends. So I probably put in, I don't know, maybe 40 hours within a couple of days to get that whole whole thing recorded. And I just broke it up into, I think it ended up being eight episodes. And I pre-recorded all those. And um, I, I totally changed up my my recording style. Normally what I'll do is I'll, I'll record the video part portion of, uh, of my video and then I'll bring it into Premiere and then I record the voiceover and then I export it and, and then put it up on YouTube. Well, for the Dayton and Troy, because I wanted to bulk record it, I did all of the building and just stopped the recordings where I wanted the episodes to end. And then when I was totally done with the route, I went into Premiere and then recorded all the voiceover continuously. So by the end of uh, the, the eighth episode, I had already been sitting in my office for probably an hour and a half recording all these voiceovers one after the other to get it done. Um, but that was a really great build. That was that was really cool. Um, I kind of wish I spent a little bit more time on some of the details on the city street scenes. Um, but it was really just meant to be a, a quickish build to get something out, have some content on my YouTube page and, uh, have something that I could release that would just be really fun to operate on. And that was totally different. I never really seen a whole lot of interurban, uh, layouts, uh, for trains and I had never done one myself. So I was kind of like, Hey, let me, let me take on this challenge. And, um, Doing the, the catenary on that was part of the biggest challenge. And really, it was going gray, I think, by the end of it because it was just really stressing me out to try to figure out how to put these tracks in the road with these super tight corners and and then lay out all of the catenary over top of it and you know still do it within the constraints of the game but try to make it look good and functional. And, man, it was, it was a real challenge. That was a real challenge. I was kind of happy to be done with it when it was over with, to be honest. When you say it was a quick build, it sounds like this one was 40 hours. So how often do your model railroad style layouts take to build? And compare that with how long it takes to build, say, a mile of track for a a route that is emulating the real world. The model railroad builds or model railroad builds tend to go much faster because you don't have to build such deep scenes. 
everything is kind of built almost on a shelf, like a shelf layout. So your scenes are only a couple of inches deep, maybe a couple of feet deep. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of time foresting an area or laying out hundreds of houses to fill up a housing development or anything like that. So I think, uh, as I said, the D&T probably took about 40 hours. Um, Needles probably took less than that. I think I did that maybe in like 20 hours because that was a smaller build. Um, Union Terminal took a little bit longer because I kind of made up that track plan and I spent about a month actually figuring out how to lay it out. And, And that one... I have total hours for that one. I think I did that one in three episodes. So that was kind of short in terms of um, the video production and the build part of it. But I did do a lot of pre-production on that one. Uh, But when it comes down to doing a full, like a mile of track, I don't know if I could break it down by how long it would take to do a mile. But I could could put it to you this way. The, The DBEV route was 16 or 17 miles long, I believe. And it was pretty linear through the mountains, and it wasn't, it didn't really have too many deep scenes or anything like that. But that route took me about a year and a half to, to fully complete. So 16 miles, and I'd probably put, uh, let me think about how many hours a week I'd put into that. It would be maybe an hour a night, two hours a night, maybe 10 hours a week. So I don't know, you do the math. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of time, a lot of build time for, for that one. So these things do take a tremendous amount of time. And I think one of the things that the community doesn't, that I wish that they understood a little bit more was how much time these things take to, to build. And I know in my videos, I make it look easy, but I'm kind of showing you what I want you to see, you know, at that point, Uh, I'm not showing you a lot of the pre-production process that goes into a build and I'm not recording the whole thing. There's a lot of stuff that happens off camera in between each cut. So there's a lot more time sunk into each build video uh, than it actually appears to be. I think they call that uh, the Pareto Pareto principle, the 80, 80, 20, 80% of the work is 20% of the product. And um, th- that definitely applies to this for sure. Cause I spend a lot of time, a 10 minute video will take me, I don't know, three hours, four hours, depending on, on what I'm doing with it, maybe even more. So, I mean, these, the time scales on getting a full map done it takes years. That's why the PNB has been taking me so long to do. Not not just because I start it and I stop it and I start it and I stop it, but just because it's so big and to cover that much mileage and to keep it interesting. Sure, I could I could throw down a million trees and just spam trees everywhere and, and call it done, you know, and, and that would be fine. But that's not going to be interesting. That's not interesting for me to build and that's not interesting to run trains on. So if you really want to spend some time on something of quality – it's gonna. It takes a long time to, to get these things done. Aside from these model railroads and these fictional railroads you've worked on, you've also started some routes that are based on real railroads and actually replicating those specific areas. The two that come to mind that I can think of right now, you've started a CSX route in the Rochester area of New York as well as Rigby Yard of the main Central Railroad. What do you like about doing prototype railroads in the train sim? Well, it's tough. When you're doing the real thing, for me, there's a lot more pressure on getting it right and making sure that it looks exactly like it does in real life in the game. And that can be incredibly challenging when you don't have the exact assets. And even if you do have something that is similar in in what it is, it's not gonna. It's not gonna have the same footprint, or it's not gonna fit the same. So you really have to use your, you know, artistic uh, determine, de- or what do you call it, artistic uh, imagination to determine what you're gonna use and what you're not gonna use. What are you gonna model? What are you not gonna model? So in some ways, when you model the real thing, I can just go right to Google Earth and go to a street view, and I can look at what's there. You know, if I have the UTM tiles, the the Google Earth underlay in the game. I know exactly where all the roads are. I know exactly where the tracks are. I know where the bridges are. I just kind of have to like connect the dots and fill it in. So in some ways, it's a little bit easier to model the real real thing. But in other ways, there's a little bit more pressure, especially when you've got people who are from the actual areas who are who will comment and tell you what you're doing wrong or what's, you know, incorrect and, and what's correct or what you can do better. So it, it tends to be a little bit more challenging to do uh, the real thing, just because you don't have as much creative freedom, you kind of have to do exactly what's, what's there. You have to model what's really there. So it, I kind of like that, but I also get really hung up on 
getting it right. Um, currently, I'm in the middle. Well, currently, I'm actually wrapping up the uh, Wanamaker, Kempton, and Southern map, which is a three and a half mile uh, little tourist railroad out in Pennsylvania. And that one, I'm using a DEM, and I'm I'm using Google Earth, and I've got everything laid out. And it was really kind of easy. It's in some ways because, like I said, I could just oh, there's a building there on Google Earth. Let me just plop a building and, and kind of match it. But in other ways, I'm thinking to myself, I want to get this perfect. I want every blade of grass to be in the right spot. I want every power line to be in the right spot if I can. I want somebody who lives near this area to go into this game and be like, oh, wow, that's so-and-so's house. You know, oh, I can't believe the game creator, he, he, he modeled that. Or, wow, this is laid out just perfectly. It, it's almost it, it, it becomes a, a diminishing return sort of thing for me at, at a point because I get too hung up on where things are and then I don't end up making progress on the route. So it, it's a double edged sword for sure. I was watching one of your videos as well as your recent live stream that you did and you were working so hard to get this apple orchard right and the combination of the challenges of doing an orchard in general and getting the trees lined up, but also finding the right assets because you're specifically building this route in spring and it's easiest to build roots in summer. That's where the bulk of nature assets are. So finding ones that work for spring was also appearing to be a challenge. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the, the biggest things with modeling in this game that, that kind of becomes a real headache for me uh, is spending a lot of time trying to find exactly the right assets. And that's, that comes along with a lot of the off-camera stuff that, that viewers don't get to see where I'm sitting in the game and I'm just thumbing through page after page of assets. And luckily for me, I have a good handful of friends on Discord who are very good at finding assets. So if I need something specific like a certain sign or a whistle post or something like that, I can ping one of these guys and within 20 minutes they'll have an asset for me. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they're really good at finding specific assets for me. Um, but yeah, but setting the WKNS in the springtime uh, definitely posed quite a challenge because as you said, with an apple orchard, I can find apple trees, but they got apples on them, but there's no apples in the spring, apples are a fall product, so I can't really use the apple trees that have apples on them. I have to find apple trees that look like apple trees. They have the, the shape and the leaf pattern, but don't contain any apples on them. Uh, so that, that can be a little bit difficult to do. Um, and, and as well as finding just the right kind of color trees. Uh, everything in the springtime is new, so the leaves are bright green. Everything's bright and, you know, fresh and full and filling out and stuff like that. So getting getting that into the game uh was has been challenging but i every route that i make i like to pose some sort of a challenge to myself i want to i want to make sure that i'm developing myself as as a, a, a i guess a route maker or an artist uh i want to make sure that i'm constantly uh i, I don't want to fall into a pattern where i'm just doing the same thing all the time and oh i always use that same tree oh i always use those same buildings which i do tend to do but you have to kind of have me do that in this game you only have so many assets available but to set the season to springtime or fall or winter i would love to do a winter route sometime in the future and that would be very challenging um you know it it it, it keeps me more engaged i don't get bored with what i'm doing so much and uh, it it helps me find new assets and kind of develop my skills a little bit further Mark Lamason asks, what do you see are the pros and cons of virtual railroading versus model railroading? This is a great question. I, you know, virtual railroading is great because, as I had said earlier, the possibilities are pretty much limitless. You can build a route as big or as small as you want. You can make a model railroad or you can model the real deal. You can import a, a DEM into the game and model, you know, like I'm doing with the Rochester CSX division, you know, track for track. You want to model your favorite prototype? You can do that track for track. You don't have to selectively compress anything. So the possibilities are there. And you can you can make your own assets if you get into 3D modeling. You can create your own stuff so that it's very specific to the route that you're creating. Um, and you can model pretty much any era that you want. Uh, all the way from, I've seen assets from the 1800s all the way up until modern day. So there's no shortage of of assets. I mean, there could be, there could always be more, of course, but the, the really, the only limit is your imagination, how you decide to use the assets. 
But on the other hand, physical model railroading is is a different kind of skill. It's more of a fine art skill. And somebody like me, I like to have I'm more tactile. If if I could have a model railroad right now, I would I would almost do that more than I would do trains. Uh, and that's just because I like to paint things by hand. I like to hold the the model in my hand. I like to assemble buildings. I like to be able to, you know, put things in very specific places or kit bash different structures or, you know, or just hear the sound of the the model trains on the tracks. You know, there's just something kind of relaxing about that. So if you're a tactile type person or if you are more of a fine artist type person, a physical model railroad just has that uh, has that tactileness that you're not going to get. You're never going to get that from from trains simulator or any model railroad simulator or anything like that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, when you're doing an actual physical model railroad, you're constrained by money and space and time. Uh, one of the benefits of of trains is that I can just boot it up for half an hour. If I got half an hour before I go to bed and I want to just lay out some trees or something like that, I could just do that really quick. I don't have to set anything up. I don't have to get my glue out and get my paint out and get my models and put on my rubber gloves and get the brushes and then clean the brushes when I'm done. I don't have to do any of that. I could just load the game up and I'm ready to go. Um, whereas uh, physical model railroad, you, you got to sit down, you have to prepare, you have to have all the tools and you have to have the time and you really have to have the space. Uh, I pretty much spent my entire life not having enough space to have a, a physical model railroad, which is why I haven't done it. Um, but it, one day when I finally have have the space, I'm definitely going to be building a physical model railroad for sure. Through your work, the routes that you've released and the fact that you share the process of creating those routes, you've created this sub community and following you have thousands of subscribers on YouTube. And then you keep mentioning this discord and I'm vaguely familiar with discord. I've had multiple people mention it to me, but it's still kind of new to me and I'm sure it's new to some of you guys out there. So what is Discord and how are you using it to connect with other train Z modelers? So Discord is, uh, I guess it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a chat program or like a group chat type program. It's really hard for me to create an analogy without mentioning like a chat room from AOL back in the day or something like that. It's sort of similar. Um, if, if anybody knows what Slack is, it's just a different version of uh, it's very similar to Slack in that you can create different subgroups of categories of topics for people to talk about in specific areas. So it's kind of like you create almost your own forum. If you go to like trains forums, you know how it's broken down into model railroading, trains 2019, or, you know, screenshots and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's a way to just set up uh, a chat where anybody who's part of Discord can join in a specific Discord server. And once they're in there, all of those categories, you know, whoever created the server will, you know, custom make their categories. Um, you can create all those chats and everybody can kind of participate and share their ideas or share their screenshots um, and talk about the game. So, I mean, essentially, that's what I've done with my Discord is is uh, I've created a place for other trains community members uh, to to get into a, a, a common spot and share ideas, share screenshots um, we just added a new section to my Discord called uh, the Asset Imp. What is it called? Asset Emporium, I believe. It, it's not something that I created. One of my mods whipped it up, which is he's doing a great job. Um, but essentially, what it is, it's a place for people to list the best assets for other people to to find. So we have it set up so that uh, if you want to share an asset, you have to post the screenshot of it. Uh, you list out the QID and where to find it. So if it's on the download station, you, you mentioned it's on the download station. If it's on a third party website, you have to put the website. So we don't actually share, by the way, we don't share any content in my discord that that is against the rules. There is no content being shared in there. Nothing is being distributed. If, if somebody gets caught with that, they get kicked out. Um, cause that's totally against the, the end user license agreement in the game. So, um, just clear that up. Uh, so what we do, uh, is that we can share these ideas, share these assets so other people can, further their skills in the game and uh, just share what they're working on. Because what's the point in this game of, of spending hours and hours building a scene if you're going to be the only one to see it? At least that's how I feel. I always felt like I needed to share my work with other people because just because like what else, what else am I doing it for? If I make a really great scene, I can sit there and stare at it all day. But 
you know, what's the point of taking a beautiful photograph or a, a painting or making a song, music or anything like that if you're not going to share it with other people to enjoy? So it's definitely a place for for that. And my favorite part so far with, with the Discord thing is I love the the camaraderie between people there. There's always good conversations going on. And while I don't always partake in, in the conversations happening, uh, it's really good to see other people getting along in there. The environment is really great. Um, people sharing ideas. And, you know, I get a lot of ideas from these guys, too. And for me, it's it's a good place to get some inspiration or maybe find assets that I didn't know about. Um, one thing that comes to mind recently is uh, there was some screenshots from some of these guys floating around of um, a lot of this like embankment spline. So there's this, t- this uh, it, asset called TB embankment, and it's an embankment that you can put underneath your track to make it look like it's you know built up on an embankment. And I kept seeing these screenshots that a couple people were sharing, and I was like, wow, this is a really cool asset. I want to make use of that at some point. And so I found out what the asset code was. I downloaded it. And it showed up in my most recent PNB episode. So I was like, well, let me try it. This is what I see other people doing. And sometimes when I release an episode where I do something a little bit different, like my handmade roads uh, or, you know, some of my designs, a couple of days later, I'll start seeing screenshots of other people doing that. So it's really good to see ideas being spread around and uh, and have like a really good community there. Because at times I feel like the trains community, at least on the forums, can get a little out of control. It can get a little rowdy. And sometimes you get some trolls that come in, people who want to bring in their baggage and stuff like that. I keep my server set up. It's, it's private. So we, it's invite only. So I usually put out like a, an invite during, um, during, uh, my live streams, or sometimes I'll put it in like a video or something like that and have like a limited number of invites. So that way we can kind of keep track of who is in the server and keep people, uh, who are actually interested in contributing positive, uh, you know, any sort of positive input about the game, uh, keep them in there. We don't want any, any of this negative stuff. We don't want people going in just to, to bash the game or to start trouble or anything like that. It's really a place right now for people to share their ideas and, uh, and further their skills with the game. As of recording this in May of 2020, your current project, as you mentioned, is the Wanamaker, Kempton, and Southern Railroad. Andrew Dietrich wants to know, what was the inspiration for creating that particular route? Uh, yeah, so the WKNS, I had honestly never heard of this route before. I'm not familiar with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, 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 had, I had never been, I had never heard of it before. And uh, Steve Laro at KNL Trains, just, he turned me on to it. He, he and I had been talking for a little while, and... Uh, He's he's always throwing ideas at me. He's like, "Yo, you should model this railroad or model this one." I think he's just trying to get me to to make routes for his to run his trains. <laughs> but I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to be partnered up with him right now. Um, but so what happened was a couple of months ago, back in April, uh, when all this COVID thing began to erupt in in the U.S., uh, I lost my job in uh, I think it was March actually. So. At that point, I was thinking, okay, well, I am now unemployed, and this is a good, great opportunity for me to focus on on developing my game, uh, or developing the game a little bit more, developing some routes, and 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 making more videos. And I wanted to just take on something different. You know, I have got plenty of free time. So Steve was like, hey, do why don't you do this WKNS route? It's like three and a half miles long. You should be able to bang this thing out in a couple of weeks. You know, we can. I'll make the the locomotive for it. I've got the rolling stock for it already. Uh, it'll be like a joint thing. We'll do another video, uh, joint video like we did for the, the deep ev and, um, you know, maybe you can make a couple bucks on it and you know, that'll kind of help you. I was like, Oh yeah, that sounds awesome. So he sent me all the information for it and I started looking at, uh, photographs of the location and I looked at it on Google earth and, uh, I just really kind of fell in love with the area and how rural it is and how different it is from everything else that I tend to build. i tend to gravitate towards downtown city type themes and not a whole lot of like farmland stuff. I spent my entire adult life pretty much in New York city. So for the most part, that's what I know. Um, so I tend to build a lot of that sort of thing. So it was really nice to have something that was very different. Um, countryside farmlands, apple orchards, and it's a short line. It's only three and a half miles long. So it was something that I, I knew I could dive into and get really, really involved in, and and spend some time on and so far i'm really happy with with how it's looking it's just about done right now i'm hoping to release it in the next week or two um but it's it's looking beautiful 
Uh, but really, I mean, the whole inspiration for that was just from from Steve mentioning it to me. And after I looked at some photographs, I kind of just fell in love with this little short line. So that's that. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about your job, but glad to hear that you've at least been able to put the time to a project like this. I wish you the best of luck in getting it back once all of this passes. Yeah, it's uh, um, you know, I'm just making the most of it right now. So I'm, I'm, I can't complain. Likewise, I'm sure a lot of you guys are listening to this at home and working on your own modeling projects and trying to get through this the best as all of us can. I'm curious, with all of these projects under your belt, so many different regions of the United States and trying different looks, what is your favorite scene of any route that you've done? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think... I think it might be on the Drybrook route, the, the right in the main yard in the downtown area. It's it's right behind a whole bunch of uh, industrial buildings and like brownstone apartment buildings, and it's kind of shoehorned into this little uh, alleyway almost behind these buildings. Um, and that's because the the railroad was there for long enough that the the city kind of just built up around it. And I, I think that that's probably my favorite scene. Just just the, the contrast of seeing a, a locomotive like directly behind an apartment building, like just a couple feet away with really close, tight crossings uh, over these sort of beat up tracks uh, on its way out into the countryside. I, I think that that's probably my favorite scene that I've that I've made. And I think it's also just because it's so familiar to me that it, it looks just like the, 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 the yard in, in Kingston that I used to see when I was a kid. So it brings back a lot of memories, and I, I think I did a pretty good job distilling that into into something that's familiar enough for a lot of people to to, to look at and say, "Oh, I can imagine that being real," um, but also specific enough that uh, I, it it kind of strikes a chord in me. When we look at the future of train simulation and the possibilities it offers, it's always interesting to see with any of these sims what new features they develop or integrate. Something that you've been involved with the testing of on the train Z front is multiplayer route editing. What has that experience been like to do the initial beta testing for that? So the beta testing for a multiplayer surveyor has been, uh, I don't want to say chaotic in a bad way because it, it's not in a bad way. It's, it, it has been interesting, I guess. Right now we're working within a very limited uh, amount of assets. So that makes it really challenging for, for, for me at least to actually get too involved in it and, and build these scenes. But, you know, I think the potential going forward for that is, is huge. If they can get that into the game, uh, you know, routes like the P and B or, or routes that are bigger than that, the CSS, CSX Rochester build that I have for trains 2019 is like a hundred miles long. You know, it would be great for me to have a few other people working on different sections of that. So the potential to actually get larger scale routes put together, uh, I think is huge if, if they can actually make this thing happen. Um, but as far as the testing process so far, it's, it's been a little all over the place. I guess they, they've got a lot of bugs that they're trying to work out. Um, a lot of times we'll log into the server and just immediately get kicked out, uh, because they're trying to figure out how they're going to have it set up on the, uh, on the server end on the server side of things. So, it can be a little frustrating at times to be involved in a beta testing process, and that's just how it is with pretty much any beta test, uh, not specifically just for this simulator. But I think the potential is there, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to them getting it out publicly for everybody to use because I think it's going to be a game changer for sure. And when you are looking at the future of where the tech's going as well as just the projects you have on the table or would like to add, what are you excited about? Uh, you know, I, I would really be excited to see trains have more of a first person view. So I, I don't really play a lot of train simulators at all. I'm not, I'm not really the type of person who drives trains. I kind of get bored with it to be perfectly honest. Uh, and I, I make jokes about that all the time that I'm really not like the best rail fan out there, but I do play train simulators and, uh, train, uh, what is it? Train sim world. I, I like that format. I like the idea that you can play first person and jump into the locomotive and throw the all the throttle and the switches and open the window and drive the train and then stop the train and get out, throw the switch, 
um, you know, go back and uncouple cars and you actually are walking and doing all the work. I think that that's really cool. And I would love to see trains implement that at some point. That That's something that I think would make the experience a little bit more immersive. Um, some people have mentioned VR. I personally, I don't I don't know about VR for any train simulator. I think that might be a little bit overkill, but it might it would be interesting to see. I would give it a try if it came out. Um, but I think overall it, in the future, I would really look forward to maybe some better route building tools, maybe an easier interface to, to bring real world, uh, DEM da- data into the game so that you can copy, um, you know, do your favorite prototype track for track. Cause right now it's kind of a convoluted process. You have to have a separate program and you have to export it and you have to have all this sort of data to, to do it. Uh, I'm not totally familiar on how that even works cause I just too much for me to do it. So, um, I would really like to see something like that be a little bit more streamlined and maybe some some easier, more fluid uh, tools and a user interface within some of these games because some of it feels a little archaic at times. So I would really hope for something like that. But as it is, I think that Trains offers a pretty uh, robust uh, package for, for, for route building. I mean, it's really easy to lay out track. I think if you had a five-minute tutorial from somebody who who knows what they're doing. And if you knew nothing of the game, you'd be able to build right away, you know, just after a couple of minutes because it's just that easy. Um, but I would like to see some, some of the, the interface cleaned up a little bit. And of course the, the multiplayer would be, would be awesome. I would actually really love to see, uh, with the multiplayer surveyor and uh, driver, it would be really great to, to be able to run some large scale operating sessions on it. Um, the P and B would be a perfect example of that because there's so many yards and so many branch lines. It would really be something else to bring in some, you know, 10 or 12 people have somebody be a dispatcher and sort of run it like a model railroad club would where, you know, somebody's a dispatcher and then you've got one crew on this train and another crew on this train and you give them the orders and you can set the signals and set the switches and run it in a really realistic way. And I think the P and B would be a perfect candidate for that for, for a large scale operating session. But right now we just don't have that. Picking up on what you were saying about tutorials and getting into it, Tony Orocho asks, how do newbies get started with TrainZ? Uh, I mean, the simple answer to that is just you got to just get the game and just start messing around with the tools. Uh, I mean, you're not going to be an expert right away. Uh, and in fact, probably the hardest thing to to learn with trains off the bat for new people is how to move around in, in the world and how to, to, to just navigate with the camera. And that's really because the movement system in this game is set up. It's designed for from 20 years ago when the game first came out. It's never changed. So uh, you don't use, most games today use the WSAD, WSAD keys to navigate around the world. Where trains, you have to hold right click on your mouse and drag to move around and then use the arrow keys to change your angle. So a game like City Skylines, for example, uses WSAD and then I think middle click to move around. So I think a lot of people default to that. And I think uh, maybe Train Sim World has a similar movement scheme. So I think the, the, the hardest thing for people to get started with is just trying to figure out how to move around. From there, once you know where the tool menus are on the on the right hand side and what they do, it's pretty straightforward. The track tab is all the track, you know, modifiers that you need if you want to start laying track. Uh, you've got a buildings tab, you've got uh, terrain tab and, um, what else? There's some other tools on there, but once you just go through each one of those tabs and just experiment with it and just get familiar with it, then you could just let your imagination run wild. And the biggest hurdle aside from the movement thing moving around is just doing something and not being afraid that you're, you're gonna, you know, not make something perfect. Like just start laying out some track, lay out a building. Your first route is going to not be great. You just have to learn how to use the interface. And then once you once you learn how to use it, navigate things and you find the assets that you like, you know, watch some of my videos, watch some of these other trains, uh, YouTubers out there. I'm not the only one out there. I might be the biggest, but I'm not the only one doing this stuff. You know, watch what other people are doing, how they uh, navigate around the world and how they, you know, utilize certain buildings or mix them together and kit bash them into something. And then try to implement that yourself. You know, it's going to take some time. The learning curve can be a little steep in the beginning. Um, But once you you get the hang of it, I mean, you could just you could just go crazy. One aspect of train simulators that much as I love model railroading and I do and I have my layout in my basement to prove it. The one feature model railroading will never have is an undo button. And I'm very thankful that train sims have that. 
my last question for you here, Joe, is at the end of the day, what do you enjoy most about the work that you do in train simulation and sharing that online with your community? So I think the thing that I enjoy most about having my YouTube channel and and having my Discord community and people on Instagram and Twitter is really just inspiring other people to to get into the hobby to begin with or even if you're not into trains just having having some kind of an artistic outlet like for me I I do love trains and model railroading but I'm not like a big train you know nut or something like that I don't know the nuts and bolts of all these trains like like other people out there people start talking to me about you know, tier four, or AC four, like, I don't know any of this stuff. I know none of it. I look, I do things because I think that they look cool. <laughs> and I like that I can inspire people to go out and, and just get started and, and do that sort of thing and, and build their own world. Because, you know, in, in times like right now, this current situation that we're in, this is, this is the best outlet that we've got is create your own world. I mean, a lot of people do it in Minecraft and some other world building games out there that, you know, whatever your outlet is, uh, trains happens to be mine because I enjoy the realism of it. So I really love to get on on Twitter and I, I check my my ads or whatever you would call it. And people will shoot me screenshots of things that they've built. And they're like, hey, check this out. You know, your last video inspired me to do this. Or I get on my Discord and somebody sent me a message that says, hey, I made this video because, you know, I liked what you did. And, and that makes that that is the most satisfying thing to me is to be able to inspire other people. I don't do any of this for some sort of self-satisfaction or, uh, you know, whatever you would call it. I, I really do uh, do my YouTube stuff to help inspire people and, and show them some techniques that, you know, maybe I didn't invent them, but maybe I can show them, you know, because somebody else made the, whatever this technique is. Maybe I'm better at explaining how to set up a railroad crossing using TRC or, or ATLS or whatever it might be than some other YouTube video or something like that. So... You know, I think it's it's really rewarding and it, it helps me uh, feel pretty good at the end of the day when other people are having a good experience and enjoying the content that I put out because I put a lot of hard work into my videos. So it's, it's good to get some good feedback um, from people and see that it's, it's actually having an impact on the community as a whole. Virtual world building is not just virtual. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much for joining us here on The Roundhouse and talking about your significant experience with trade simulation and i look forward to seeing your upcoming wks route released which by the time this episode's out it will probably be out there so if it is you guys should go and check it out and i'll have links in the show notes for his channel and you can see some of his work there joe thank you so much thanks a lot for having me nick this has been fun and now the question of the day Last time on The Roundhouse, we were talking with Lindsay Alley, museum manager for the O. Winston Link Museum, about this man's legacy, his photography, which led to the question, what is your favorite O. Winston Link photo? Here are some of your answers. First, from the roundhousepodcast.com, Nick Chilianis writes, it would have to be the first one I ever saw. Highball for the doubleheader near Bonsack, Virginia in 1959. The color shot featured on the album of Thunder on Blue Ridge. On Facebook, Eric Capusta writes, Birmingham Special, Rural Retreat, Christmas Eve 1957. There's a recording that goes with it too. And lastly, from Brian Brooks, Maud bows to the Virginia Creeper. I love the Abingdon Branch photo series. His photos of this remote branch line have such down-home character. What a major contrast to the N and W main lines where massive articulative steam and sleek jays ruled. I would agree with Brian that the Abingdon branch is my personal favorite of his work. It's to his credit that he captured all of these different pieces of the N and W so well. In fact, I found myself making a train Z route about the N and W which uh, for train simulator which i'll probably be sharing a blog post of soon and should also be coming out for release in the not too distant future your question of the day for this episode is what is your favorite train simulator let me know on the roundhousepodcast.com links to social media there don't forget to check out the patreon you get 
the opportunity to get early access to episodes like this one. So I thank you guys who support the show for listening. And remember, as always, that the Roundhouse is our house. <laughs>